All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's so great to um, see all of you here. And uh, we are very excited to talk about connected learning. Um, and thanks for all of you who are coming. Um, we're going to have a great time. Betsy DeVos is not going to have anything on us <laughs> on this group. So listen, I wanted to just take the opportunity um, to really get some feedback from you all. First of all, how many educators do we have in the room or folks representing uh, school districts? Um, great. What about um, uh, uh, nonprofit organizations that are involved in education? Um, any uh, representatives from the tech sector? A couple. Good. That's awesome. Um, so Tom Vanderark, who you know has been um, you know the beacon for so many of us for so, <laughs> in the Ed Reform movement for so many years, uh, just gave me some advice on what to do. So I do everything Tom suggests, um, which is you know let's get some audience participation starting out um, instead of waiting to the end. And would like to uh, get six examples that any of you would love to like to share about uh, what you think connected learning is. What? You only get six words to do it. Six words or less. <laughs> Give us a great example of connected learning. For Headlines. Headlines. Six words mm -hmm. or less. Spencer's going to start. Is Spencer going to start? Oh. Well, this young, this lady. OK, I'm moderating. <laughs> now enough. OK, let, let this lady speak. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes. um, I'd say learning by doing. Learning by doing. Mm. Like, uh, nice. Awesome. OK, Spencer. <laughs> I would just say. Oh, wait one second for the mic, please that extend beyond the walls of the school. Okay. Opportunities that extend beyond the walls of the school or the learning that extends beyond the walls of the school. Awesome. And Spencer's doing it in Beijing. Nice. That's terrific. Any others? Oh, come on. All right, Tim Carn. Oh, okay. See, I was going to pick on you, Tim Carnan. Yeah. <laughs> Tim Stewart from Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, I would say using the local resources as a classroom for your students. That's more than six words. Awesome. Any others? Tim Carnahan, oh, you want to say oh, something? Scott. Uh, dual credit opportunities for students to get credit at the college or accelerated high school level outside the classroom. Interesting. Scott, uh, describe, wow. describe um, connected learning at I'm A plus up in six hand. words or less. I'm so cutting this up. <laughs> Six words or less? Yes. It's four. <laughs> um, building relationships. Um, with museums. Seeing, uh, yeah, with museums. Seeing kids soar. I don't know. That's like eight. That's our good. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, thank all of you all for sharing those examples and uh, for being here to talk about uh, personalized learning and how do we connect learning in and out of school. And my name is Phyllis Lockett. I'm the CEO of Leap Innovations um, in Chicago. We are working uh, to advance personalized learning. And one of the areas that we've been really passionate about um, is around the, the teacher practice and strategies of personalized learning. Um, and, and how we really leverage um, education technologies to help scale it. Um, many of our educators when we started were pushing back saying, listen, what is personalized learning? What does it mean? What is the practicality of what this looks like in my classroom? So our team worked uh, for over a year with a lot of expertise um, in PBL and Montessori um, to define the first lexicon for personalized learning in the country. Um, it's the Leap Learning Framework and uh, really outlines really specific teacher strategies that teachers can apply in their classroom. And we have three big components, and the fourth one, um, you know, around all the things we all talk about, competency approaches, uh, learner demonstrated, learner focused, focusing on learning, every child has a path, um, the, the fact that um, learning has to, has to um, be, be uh, have to have demonstration of, of, of evidence of choice and agency. Um, but the fourth component is the one I've been really passionate about, which is learner connected. The learning's got to be connected. That this notion that learning and all the learning that uh, is sourced uh, from, from, from our students happens in a classroom, in the four walls of a classroom, is a complete misnomer, especially as we think about 
um, the, the, the incredible opportunities that personalized learning has in leveling the playing field and creating access um, in, in terms of real world experiences and linking our students to, to, to the workforce, which is really mm -hmm. the key. Um, and so these incredible leaders have been um, uh, you know, really championing this um, a lot longer than we have. We are launching our, our effort um, in, our, in, our, in our framework for Learner Connected today. So you can go to leaplearningframework.org, which is there to uh, take a look at it. But um, the folks that have been really doing and championing the work are right here. So Eric Davis, who is also from Chicago, who leads an extraordinary um, school, um, GCE, and he's leveraged uh, that uh, to the next level um, with GLM models, where he's helping schools uh, really do incredible project-based learning work um, in the real world. Connie Yao, who um, you know, has spearheaded uh, so much of this work um, in, in her previous role at the MacArthur Foundation um, that we're going to be uh, learning a lot from, who I've learned a ton from um, around this whole connected learning um, arena. Uh, Todd Burkus, um, who is the CEO of Mayon, who as an EdTech leader um, has been uh, advancing um, uh, Mayon in incredible ways to connect kids to learning uh, in and out of school um, at scale across various cities and states, so he'll be sharing that. And then none other than Tom Vanderark, who um, has been kind of the godfather to many of us, uh, <laughs> even in starting the education um, effort at the Gates Foundation, and uh, has, been, has been leading across all these efforts. So uh, I want to start with Connie. OK. Because you know, in, in your role, this $80 million effort. It's uh, 200 million. Oh my god, yes. 200 million, <laughs> geez. $200 million effort. <laughs> Um, around you know, digital youth um, at the MacArthur Foundation uh, funded and commissioned a lot of the research <laughs> mm -hmm. of which we are, we are still learning from and building from today. So can you yeah. share a little bit about, about sure. the context? Sure, I'd be happy to. And, and I also want to say, Phyllis, um, congratulations, both on the report that's coming out, but also you and I have known each other for a long time now. I'm from Chicago as well. Mm -hmm. And the work that you've done, but the work that LEAP is doing now is just so critically important. I just want to Thank congratulate you. you on doing such great work, you and your team. Thank you. Um, so I have had the privilege, uh, up until 18 months ago, for 15 years, I was the director of education at the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. And for 10 of that, uh, I oversaw a very large initiative that we call Digital Media and Learning. And the core purpose of that initiative in the beginning was really, you know, we started it in 2003, so this is before Facebook, before iPhone, before a whole set of things, was to really understand how the new digital uh, media tools could change learning. And what we did to, to start with and did for several years was we decided that the most important way to figure that out and to think about learning was to start with the youth. And so we funded the largest ethnographic study ever, I think, on how young people learn. It was a 700, I mean, if you guys know ethnography, you usually have sort of an N or subjects of five or 10. We had 700 young people that we followed over three years. Um, and part of what we really wanted to find out was, how were they learning? What, does the, what happens when the most engaged learning is taking place? And so we spent a ton of time with the kids in school and out of school. Um, and I will confess that the most engaged learning that we saw was out of school. Um, and there are three big things um, that we saw, and, and you know, I had a ton of researchers, and at the end of the day, and after several 200-page reports, I said, give me a sentence. You know, and of course, they gave me several paragraphs, and then I'd say, give me a sentence. And I even have three words, which is um, the three words that I would say really defines coming out of this research connected learning at its simplest are passions, people, and paths. Mm. So what we found, the most robust learning happens when a young person, when three things are connected, when a young person is engaged in the thing that they most want to get better at. Right? And you can call it an interest, or you can call it passion driven, but the core thing that's happening is that they really want to get better at something that they care deeply about. That they, that, that passion or that purpose around which they want to get better is embedded in a group of peers. Some researchers call it an affinity group, but is connected to a set of peers that also have expertise and want to get better at the same thing. And we're all school people, so we might think of peers as age, 
as an age-related thing. Peers in this context means folks who have the same shared interest. And so what's really critical is those communities that young people were embedded in were cross-age, right? So that there is expertise in the community, there's novices in the community, and there's lots of peer sharing and feedback going on. And then the third thing is that what that's connected, what they're trying to get better at, and that shared purpose group is connected to something relevant in the world. Right, so much of our learning is decontextualized and we've got young people learning particular skills. But for the young person, what matters to them is that they can understand how what they're doing is gonna make a difference in the world that they care about. Right, and so that relevance can be, it can be connected to a job, it could even be connected to making their community better, it can be connected to a whole set, it could be connected to I'm getting what I'm doing published and my peers are gonna see it. Like there are lots of ways to make something relevant, but they have to understand why they're doing what they're doing. And so once we had that research done, we then sort of started looking at our institutions, at our schools and our libraries and museums and thought, oh God, that's not what's happening in our institutions. And so then we started funding a whole set of design experiments to say, what if we reimagined what the library looks like and really tried to think about the library as a place where young people are participating and producing and, make and, create and making things and also getting that connected back to the real world. In that work, we saw on average, we would see, and you would think, because a lot of this is digital, so let me back up and say, part of what was also really exciting about the work is that we now live in a time when we have the tools where it's actually possible to create those kinds of connections. Right, because the design pillars that allow those things to happen are that learning's participatory, we've got tons of networking and participatory tools, that it's about making and creating, and we've got all of these tools now where you can be a maker and creator and it's not expensive, and that you can easily see relevance in the world because kids don't have to be siloed in classrooms but can be networked pretty easily to the rest of the world. And I'll stop in a sec, which is to, the final thing I'll say is, our, what, what we also found from our young people is that interests happen in one place, primarily in the informal and out of school space, which is where kids really get to pursue what they're most interested in. Um, getting better at something actually is more organized in schools than in other places. Relevance in the world could be in workforce or in another set of contexts. And so teachers or museum folks, whoever wants to implement this approach to learning right now, because of the way our systems are siloed, has to be somewhat heroic, right? It, it is backbreaking to build these connections. And so the next step of the work is really, so then how do we make this easier? That's right, that's yeah. exactly right. And, I, and one of the, the hot buttons I've, I've had with Connie for a long time mm -hmm. is that, you know, she's built this incredible network. Um, you guys have maybe heard of The Hive and mm -hmm. other multiple cities. Yeah. Um, at this point, and it's this inc you know, incredible network of out-of-school institutions that are now linked to create these experiences for students. You know, the, the, the key is how do we connect that back into school mm -hmm. and that um, in an accredited way, in a way that helps inform our educators yep. about what our students are doing outside of school yep. um, to further advance their personalized ex learning path. Mm -hmm. And so, Eric, you've done this you're doing this every day. Can you share some of your examples? Sure. Thank you, and thanks for the context also. And I'll start at UMedia. Great. It's, uh, you, you, UMedia is, um, was funded by uh, MacArthur oh, Foundation. Okay. And um, is an, if, for those of you who don't know what UMedia is, it's the reality of what happens when a library goes from a space that's archives of books to a space that kids can play and experiment. Um, and in Chicago, UMedia is located uh, right downtown. Um, in the Harold Washington Library. Uh, we built a school in downtown Chicago, and uh, our city is the classroom. That's, our tagline is break down the walls between school and the world. That's the idea. Um, and our model is built, our whole learning model is built around what are the core skills, what's the context, who's doing it, why does it matter, the relevance. So we have purpose, we have relevance and context, and then we want to see them do something. So they have to take action. But there aren't that many, like, I ran a small school and we didn't have capacity to fund a lab like the one that was built. But we do have 85 cent bus passes for our kids to go there. 
Um, and the way we built our model is that's where we wanted our kids. Because when you actually move them to a different environment, you're practicing an enormous range of soft skills. So in order simply to get our kids from our school a few miles away to take advantage of this facility, we start thinking about how do you embed this community to classroom or city to classroom learning experience in the actual learning model. Mm -hmm. So where are kids practicing all of the soft skills, the executive functioning skills, the urban orienteering, the planning, the prep, the code switching, the dressing appropriately, the moving through public spaces on public transportation, on sidewalks, I'm sure you've passed teenagers on sidewalks before. Um, you know, how do we handle, how do they handle that? How do we pass the experience of planning a field trip and turn it into, this is actually your learning environment. Um, so that's what we tried to build in one school and then to model the things that scale. Um, our kids would go down to Umedia regularly. They would go to the museums, the institutions, whether it's a historical society in Chicago or they're down at Museum of Science and Industry. But they did much more. They engaged with their peers, they engaged with their families, they engaged with their friends, and they engaged on every city block along the way. So if the appropriate place for them to learn about a food desert is to go down to Kenwood, then that's where they go. If the appropriate place for them to learn about uh, bike design is to go to uh, a small bike shop, which is a block away, then that's where they go. Um, and I'm sure more stuff will come back up later. Mm -hmm. So our school starts in the world and carries yeah, that idea that's forward. Terrific. So, so Tom, you've had your eye on this nationally for a long time. Any, can you talk about any other uh, really innovative school examples or networks that are doing this, um, you, know, it, it, you know, at the next level even? So quick word of thanks to Phyllis and Leap Innovation. They're doing great work in Chicago. They facilitated a big visit um, that I, I ran a couple weeks ago with 20 people from Kansas City, and we got to see you know, half a dozen really amazing schools uh, in Chicago that she is supporting. Um, and a quick story about Connie. Um, I, I learned a lot of those lessons on my epic school tour in 1999, Bill Gates said, why don't you spend six months just visiting schools and see what you learn and come back and tell me what to do. And I, I saw schools yeah. that, that created that passion and mm -hmm. purpose and path for young people. And then like a lot of the rest of the country, I got really distracted by NCLB and mm -hmm. uh, Common Core in the early parts of the last decade, and I remember wondering, what the heck is Connie doing anyway? She's doing <laughs> libraries and this out of school stuff, and um, your work really helped get us focused on learner experience, mm -hmm. and why and how and where kids learn, and so now I sheepishly keep coming back to Connie's uh, work as being really um, out front in getting focused on the real work, the important work of, of figuring out how and where kids learn. Uh, we're leading at Getting Smart, we're leading a campaign this year called Place-Based Education. It's hashtag Place-Based Ed. We're working with a Teton Science School. Uh, TetonScience.org is a network of small uh, STEM-focused micro schools in Idaho and Wyoming. And they're really best in class when it comes to place-based learning, particularly uh, outdoor science. So it's Jackson Hole, so you know it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. So it's not hard to imagine getting kids out uh, outdoor to do science. But um, they have helped schools all over the country and all over the world. They're helping Bhutan, um, who adopted the Indian system, uh, and it's this terrible test-based system that's focused on test scores. And they're in this most beautiful place in the world, and they weren't really taking advantage of that. So Teton is even helping Bhutan re-engineer their system. And with them, we've launched this campaign called Place-Based Ed that's allowed us to highlight schools all over the world that are giving kids the gift of place, getting them outside of school and leveraging local uh, community assets. So I mentioned earlier, Scott Van, Van Beek is with Houston A+. Uh, they have a micro school connected to the museum district. And now, uh, yesterday we were talking about taking that model and you know, connecting it to an art district, connecting it to a park. And so now that we have these new tools and the ability of platform um, where you can create a, a really great school with two teachers and 40 kids and mm -hmm. you can attach it to any community asset, 
um, and really help kids understand that every place is a place and where you're from is a gift. And as Larry Rosenstock said in a, in a, re a recent Getting Smart podcast, the city is the text. Mm -hmm. Use it. Get kids outside and uh, help them look up and uh, learn and learn together. So w we're really excited about this phase of personalized learning. Um, I, I, I think back just five years ago when, when, like a lot of us, I was really preoccupied with blended learning mm -hmm. and figuring out exactly how that worked in station rotation models. And when I started visiting schools, I saw kids that were head down, sort of clicking through crappy content, and I thought, oh man, we've just recreated worksheets, they're yeah. just digital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's another version of school that sucks. Mm -hmm. uh, and so our new challenge is, how do we use those tools and connect kids with community and help them do interesting, engaging, authentic, community-connected work, and then you know, using uh, these frameworks from, from LEAP and LRNG, help them get credit for it so that uh, you, we really can foster a new age of anywhere, anytime learning. Yeah. That's great. So Todd, you've been doing some of this, because I do want to circle back on the LRNG and the platform mm -hmm. around how we get, make this accreditation yep. real. Um, but, but Todd, you've been really leveraging your technology um, with Myon to scale this um, at, you know, w throughout, you know, challenges. Uh, so talk, can you share? Sure, I mean, I'll that? be the uh, developer slash entrepreneur on the yeah. stage that maybe some of you will relate to that. And best dressed. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. I, I had to sit next to Tom, and between these two, I had to let's stick out at least with the coat. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you, you did it well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so my career has been, first as an educator, and then as an entrepreneur, a, a tech entrepreneur, and I had a stint at, you know, thinking about personalized literacy and learning in more I would call the drill and kill world. And I think right. first e evolution of this model was if we can just get an electronic learning path built based on a diagnostic prescriptive and then send kids into a learning path, it's gonna be awesome. Right. And yes, is it appropriate to find gaps for kids and help them and remediate and support them? Absolutely, and without a doubt for those that develop these types of software, I'm not discrediting that, but I think to pick up on Tom's point, us developers and people who have built software for the industry, it's not that way mm -hmm. and, and to scale to an appropriate community-based, personalized and connected learning model. And I think we have learned a tremendous amount from Leap because I even built our professional development model on the frameworks that they're building and our, and our staging. I remember sitting in your office that day and Kapow, the brain pops in it. No, pun intended, it wasn't brain pop, it was <laughs> Mayan. <laughs> Sorry, Dean. Uh, but the idea that we could think about teacher professional development in a per personalized literacy context that wasn't going to take away from their experience and their opportunity, but was gonna alleviate some of that pain of personalized learning. And, and so I, uh, the scale piece on this, and the message yeah. I think for the developers in the audience is, one, it's not just an algorithm. It's got to be personalized, and personalized does not mean that the test knows. That's right. Two, that the community matters and the connectedness yeah, around right. that, the parents and the out-of-school learning space. 56% of our entire usage sessions are out-of-school. Out-of-school hours. In our LEAP schools, tremendous usage out-of-school. South Berwyn School District in Chicago area, 97% Latino, 100% access on Mayan, and their literacy scores are growing, their proficiency levels are growing. And I'm not saying there's a magic bullet software, and that's the last thing that I believe that one solution is creating that, but their connected model between what the principals are saying, what the teachers are doing, and this interconnection between literacy that's on demand and just in time, and it's not the summer reading list that I'm given mm -hmm. and I'm forced to read, it's not the um, exact curriculum spec that I'm supposed to integrate this digital book. It's about getting kids to be experts and creating that knowledge of learning that books are still really needed and digital books yeah. are fine for that. Print as well, but I believe obviously an, an ability to change the inventory model where it's been restrictive for us to have libraries on a check-in, check-out model, we've got to flip this model. I think publishers are starting to finally come around to this, that I can have an all-you-can-read model and a licensing mm -hmm. model that will work and we can start to transform these literacy and learning environments that are not just bound to a physical place like the library or the classroom. Right. That literacy and an opportunity for reading comes out outside yeah. of that. And one of the things yeah. you, you didn't mention, for those of you who aren't familiar with Mayan, is that the, this Taylor library is based on the students 
need, uh, well, needs, first of all, kind of, kind of anchored on, on, on where they are, but also their interests. What are they interested in reading? And how that translates to the, uh, the you know, they're, they're reading a lot more, <laughs> like That's surprise, right. surprise. Mm -hmm. um, so again, how have you taken the, the base of what Mayan does uh, to scale its cities? You've created challenges sure, sure. that connects that back to communities. Yeah, so yeah. we've got one great example. It's actually, I, I talked about it on, on Tom's blog, so go to Getting Smart, and uh, read about creating a community of, of readers. And the idea in, in Tampa, I'll use Tampa as an example, um, over the last six years, they've read over 30 million books in this community, and they decided not just to take this to the superintendent and the school board and the district, and it's gonna be this um, you know, K-8 solution that everybody's gonna use in their school and, and their classroom, but they said, and this is, Mary Elia really was the, was the visionary behind this, now the state superintendent in New York, um, but said, what if we could have every child from birth to eighth grade have access to a, a library of digital books that was personalized for them? And what if we could measure that as a community every month and talk about is literacy growing in our community? And what if we could engage the sports teams, the YMCAs, the museums, the libraries, the public libraries, and what if we could actually have them fund some of this as well and create a community of readers in this city? And so uh, whether it was Secretary Castro that came down there and saw what the housing authority and they put 50 grand into this project every year and that basically said, they are gonna become a community of readers and it's making an impact. And I think what they're seeing in both, you know, they'll do book giveaways, digital book, Book of the month for their sports teams. The Tampa Bay Buck will send out a tweet about a book they're reading. The governor, or the mayor of the city, uh, the, the city council, they'll they'll be talking about literacy. They even have billboards in their community about reading digitally and getting access to books. So I think going to scale, we all have to think about our programs and our and our solutions, blending into that outside of school environment and connecting even even the non uh, public school students to that. That's awesome. Eric, as you a, to say uh, thank you. Yeah, as I'm listening to this. Intro thing. I, I realize we're we're all taking well, we're taking notes. I, I take notes, <laughs> yeah. but there's there's three words that have been staying in my mind almost this whole time, and that's self, other, world. And when we think whether we're talking about scale or we're talking about connected learning, mm -hmm. or we're talking about at a certain place or in relationship with others, it's all of those. But it really does boil out like, can you hook that first child? Mm -hmm. Can you do they? Are you meeting them? Do they care about what they're doing? Purpose or passion? Um, are they connected with others? Is it social in some way? Does it have meaning in relationship? And then does it, does it extend into the world? And th those three are the ones that keep coming yeah, back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me, oh, go ahead. Can I make a quick point? Yeah, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so I, I want to make a, just a quick point as I'm listening to what we're saying, both around the, the, why the notion of community is so important and then also to tie it to equity, mm. which is to say, I think you're hearing us really talk about connecting in and out of school and the importance of the community in the out of school space. And that in part, and you, it, it's possible to actually hear that as a critique of school. And school is failing and can't do these things. We need a more flexible space to connect it to. That's actually, I think, not the point that's so important here. Um, I'm a former tenured professor, so I'm a recovering academic. So forgive me for this. But in, when, any, when I teach the history of education, our founding fathers, when they created the public education system, always understood it to be one of many institutions mm -hmm. that would be responsible for the education of our kids, and that it was the church, it was the library, it was the community, and that was all, and so the school had, had a particular role, but it didn't have to do everything. And each time we've hit some sort of social difficulty, um, we have turned to our schools to solve the problem. And so over the course of the last hundred years, our schools have been overwhelmed with things that they've had to do for which they don't have resources they weren't designed for and was never the intent. And so part of what you hear us talking about is actually, particularly with our technology, beginning to build that lightweight infrastructure that enables us to create an ecosystem for learning to actually allow the kinds of interactions across our institutions and our communities and families that we always should have had. So I think that's part of what we're after. And then, the, um, Phyllis, I swear I'll be really quick. I would argue that it is this lack of connection that is at the core of our equity gap. Because when the connections yeah. aren't made, who makes those connections? Middle class parents with privilege are making all of those connections. I do that for my kids all of the time. And so our low income kids are the ones who are suffering from us not having built out this mm -hmm. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, you know, I'm from the south side of Chicago. Yeah. It was because my parents exposed me. Um, those exposure points helped to help to create those opportunities. Right. So I want to talk about this from. Um, so for the principals who are in this room, Eric, you know, 
talk about how you are leveraging community assets uh, to create real world learning experiences and how your educators facilitate that in an accredited way. And then I want to kind of get some examples from each of you of how we take it from a school level to a network level to a city level and world level. So uh, I know you're all going to add a bunch of stuff. I'll try to keep this part yep. relatively brief. Um, so we built a school in Chicago, and then we've scaled the model. We, we licensed locally in the city, worked with a few other schools, and now we're fortunate enough to work with uh, schools around the country, including one AISU, American International School of Utah, right up the road. Um, and this is the conundrum because people, there's this tremendous fear and anxiety around what if, and before you've even started thinking about, well, what if, fill in the, instead of filling in the blank with all the anxieties, what if kids, and then you put in the aspirational outcomes, and then suddenly those other limitations, the, the bureaucratic limitations, the transportation limitations, the funding limitations, those are actually all solvable. If your aspiration is that the education is owned by the students and that it's connected to the world, um, so some really practical things. Learning did not exist, or LRNG did not exist at the time when we started the school, um, and there was nobody else with a massive database of all of the different people. So we ask a very simple question. Who's the best in the world, and how do we learn with them? And we think about what we have to do to help our kids prepare for those things. We're a project-based model, so for us, the experience in the world is, I don't want to say a bridge, um, it's the, it's a pathway, um, it's a thing that connects school to the learning that they want to do. Um, and in 40 minutes, you can actually change, you can see somebody's life change. And these are really practical things. So what did we think about? We thought about where we were located, and we thought about the themes and the projects we were doing. And we looked at, okay, do the kids need to develop specific skills, or do they need inspiration? Do they need context so that the so what question's answered? Do they need a place to try and fail safely? Do they actually need resources that they don't have in the school? And that's how we started to fill out these, this ultimately a database. Um, and then we looked at, we mapped every class, every project, every skill, every competency to people in the world who are doing that. And then we started thinking about, well, what are some of those limitations? Can we get our kids there? How many kids can we get there? In what weather, we live in Chicago, in what weather can we get our kids there? What's the safety issue related to that? How can our kids actually plan that entire thing? What's the prep work, as I mentioned before? And that's embedded in curriculum. So now you're talking about a dramatic shift in your curriculum being, again, drill and kill, to use that very painful phrase, to something that becomes whole child. Mm -hmm. We're talking about non-cognitive executive functioning skills. That's really what we're talking about. Embedding that learning journey into the classroom because you need a safe place to try and fail. So where do we practice those? In the school. And then I'll stop here because I know you guys are going to jump on this and it may come back. Great. Um, Connie, in terms mm -hmm. of the network, can you just again talk about the platform? Yep. Um, that LRNG has created and, mm -hmm. and again how we get that connected Yep. Outside world to in yeah. class. Yeah, so I spun out of MacArthur about 18 months ago to, to, with a new organization called Collective Shift and to, we have an effort we call LRNG that has a multi-sided platform and a set of services that are at the core of what we do. The purpose of the platform in a nutshell is that uh, as I was funding new medias, Hive Networks, a set of things, I really felt at the end of the day that we, it was, people were just, as I said, having to be too heroic and that we were not going to get to scale. And part of what I thought was one of the frictions for being, uh, making this happen is that it is, uh, at the end of the day, about relationships and partnerships in order to make this happen. For people, particularly in the education community, when it's because you're talking about other people's kids, it take, there's a high bar that we all have to meet on trust in terms of whether or not we're going to partner with each other. And so we as educators spend all of our time in meetings and having conversations back and forth, right? And as soon as I create a relationship with you and we're gonna to partner together, and then you go to another job, and I'll be damned if I don't have to start all over, right? And so that, we have that experience over and over and over again, and so we wanted to create a platform that would enable us to share what's at the core of our interaction, which is about the content and experiences that our young people are having, both in the face-to-face -face world and online. So that Eric can share what he's doing, I can share what I'm doing, the platform is very flexible and would allow me to take his content or his experiences and create my own path for my kids. 
And then to be able to have those paths, the other thing that's really hard in the informal space, and for, for those of you that are in the informal space, uh, you off, we often get cannibalized by schools because schools have a monopoly on what counts as learning. And so we create, for four years I worked with the Mozilla Foundation and funded them to create a, a certificate called the Open Badge Standard. And the idea was to create something that could hold the core information that we all could agree is critical for knowing whether or not a young person has a skill and competency. And for that badge, and this is something we probably won't get to, to be interoperable, yeah. which means the badge can live on anybody's platform. Because as you said, there's no silver bullet, there's no single tech platform, we all have to be interoperable. So we can mix and remix our content and how we work together, and it could be content, it could be a program at the UMedia, and you've got something going on in your school, and you're just organizing that into a pathway that yeah. is the, the, your curriculum for your, yeah. your class or for what you're doing in the world. And then you could decide that it's all going to level up to this badge that's earned that then gets unlocked and leaves the kit and enables the young person to go on to their next set of experiences. Can I build on In a nutshell, quick? that's what we're about. So yeah. this is a really important interplay. So coming from the principal's perspective or a recovering principal, um, <laughs> so I think about how we make that transparent. The, like, how do you believe, why do you believe that that's worth doing? Um, and where that shows up for us is in our student work. How do they demonstrate mastery? Yeah. And one of the ways that our students dem demonstrate mastery is they all do digital portfolios. Mm -hmm. And this is obviously yeah. another yep. very, very important piece of the puzzle. Um, one of the things that shows up in the digital portfolios is reflection. This is what I learned. This is how I grew. This was the purpose of the project, and this is how I did it. And this is where my perspective changed, right? And it's the relationship with that last point that really shifts, because the student is then sharing back and validating the professional's experience, as opposed to merely a one-way badging. Right. You are not only honoring the work I'm doing as a student, I am honoring your work in the community being yourself. You're not doing anything but the work that you want to be doing. And when you have this mutually complementary purpose, you can really see the gain. So for us, it was embedding it all the way so that the kids were the one validating that yep. experience. Yep. Mm, that's great. The challenge that you did in Tampa, or you could pick Houston or wherever, how did you get that connected back to, how were, how were the, the, the schools involved? How were the educators involved? I mean, how I was think, that valued? Well, yeah, obviously, the biggest challenge in our educational systems, especially the large systems that exist, is communication. And this idea of communication has been challenging. So we just did a project. I'm going to talk about Arizona for a second with the state of Arizona and the final four. And the, the concept was uh, every third grader in Arizona got access to Mayan, and they were going to compete with other third graders. And the top third grade reader schools were going to the Final Four fan day, <laughs> and the top readers were going to the Final Four. And the, the difficulty was, wow, we've got this opportunity to compete. And all of a sudden, the kids who knew about it, and this gets into the equity thing and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and how communication can really lack in certain areas, the kids who knew um, it just exploded reading. And, and I always struggle with the intrinsic, extrinsic, and badging yeah. as intrinsic and extrinsic. And, yeah. and, but at the same time, hey, we're all motivated by different things. And I think some kids are motivated by just seeing their bar chart go up and saying, wow, look how much I've read. And other mm -hmm. kids are on exposing and getting the badge, and other kids on getting to go to the final four. So, and most of those kids were definitely exposed to that. But I think the biggest challenge in that scale, model, one, we had 457 schools participate. It was an amazing uh, venture. Uh, you, you know, the challenge is those third graders that got the best communication got to the final four, and those that didn't. Mm -hmm. Now, the good news, it was 50-50 in terms of, you know, low-need schools and high-need schools, um, but the challenge as I, as I think on these things, and this is just an education challenge, is how do we get from the superintendent to the administration to the school principal to the school, to the teachers, to the parents, to the students, and our best examples are when the kids just take off with it. And we were in Orange County, Florida, and the teachers had their professional development day 30 days after they were getting exposed to a personalized reading environment. And the teachers were like, who's been in this system? What's going on here? And the kids had stolen the passwords and figured it out. <laughs> and, and, and all of a sudden, reading was happening without any direction exactly. from teachers. So how do we get more kid-based? And mm -hmm. you know, let's tweet the secret code for Mayan or whatever product they're using to see if we can't uh, assemble that. But, I think scaling out communication, awareness, mm -hmm. and we're doing a lot of community involvement. So obviously the YMCA's, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the, and Phyllis, you and I have talked about how do we get this after school and out yep. of school learning right. time with churches and, and, and parents and others that just get motivated and excited about 
something as simply becoming an expert in something and, and learning more about that and deep diving. Yeah. Yep. These are great examples. And so Tom, talk, again, what's it going to take, right, to get this at scale? So is that Karen Kidder wandering around back there? Yeah. Hi, oh. Karen. Hi, Karen. So Karen and Eric and I, <laughs> Wait a minute, Karen, Karen, and, uh, no Karen and Eric and I um, uh, love the idea of big challenges. Um, and we're, we're all big supporters of uh, Global Goals, globalgoals.org, and love the idea of challenge-based learning, of encouraging kids to take on these big yeah. challenges. Global, you know, it's, it's hunger, poverty, it's life on land, life on sea. But to take it on in a small way in your neighborhood, right? How could I clean up water in my neighborhood? How could I make my, my neighborhood more sustainable? So global goals connected to the local community. So great resources on Karen's site, great resources on Eric's site, or just go to globalgoals.org. Mm -hmm. This kind of work takes um, big blocks of time. Um, are there any new tech folks here? Newtechnetwork.org? So this is a network of project-based schools, 200 of them around the country, and they're, they're all wall-to-wall -wall PBL, and they, their main building block is integrated courses. So big double classrooms with two teachers teaching big extended challenge-based courses. So, that's an example of a national network with an infrastructure suited to challenge-based learning. So I'm a, I'm a big supporter of big blocks and, um, and big, cha big challenges as uh, the infrastructure. Uh, in our last, um, in a couple sessions today, we've highlighted Summit Public Schools. Summit gets a lot of attention for their learning platform. The coolest thing about the network is that every six weeks they stop and kids get to pick a two-week activity called an expedition. Mm -hmm. And they get tons of choices and it's magic for kids and it provides 50 days of PD for Summit Learning teachers. So more PD than anybody in the country and, uh, and kids get to do stuff they love to do. So mm -hmm. it's a win-win a because the network made this big uh, commitment to, uh, to big blocks of community-connected learning. That's what I was going to ask you, was around how we get more of our educators connected to this kind of approach to learning, right? Yeah. So, and then I'm going to open up for questions. So, so just... uh, there, there's a lot of good schools in this, in this room represented. So mm -hmm. visit schools that are doing this. Check out place-based ed, uh, the hashtag place-based ed, and go see what schools are doing. Um, I think we all believe that badges and portfolios are going to be key pieces of evidence that uh, students are going to have to demonstrate uh, what they've learned and then we want that to be clicked through so that you can go see what they yeah. did and then find the artifact uh, to, right. to back it up. So that's going to take some work. Those tools are, uh, are emerging, but mm -hmm. big blocks, big challenges right. and badges and portfolios. And Eric, one, one other I, comment. I want to make a open. shameless plug for mm -hmm. Leap here real quick. Um, so the framework, the, one of my favorite things about the framework is that there's entry level strategies and vision strategies. Entry level strategies are the things that you can do today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Today I can use this piece, I can do this thing, and I will make incremental gains right now. I don't need the big block. The vision level, I need the big block. And then I need to figure out how that's going to implement the route. So when you look at the framework, please do. There's different access points for you. I actually yep. think that that's a major, major gift. So yeah. The, yeah. the key is really working around the edge. It's taking whatever yeah. entry point you've got. Yeah. If mm -hmm. it's summer school, if it's after mm -hmm. school, if it's a, an elective class that you can sneak in, anybody can yep. find an easy place to start community-connected learning. And That's one it. other quick point, it, for those of you vendors who are selling pieces, give your customers success models like expert hour. Let them yeah. go research in your product, get it out of the scope and sequence and the structure, and let them become experts in, in the content and the information that you have so they can present. Well, since you said that, and build for any tech companies that are there, or friends that you have who are running tech companies, can you build in the, the, the construct so we can measure how much out-of-school learning is yes, happening? Absolutely. That is, like, build that yeah, in yeah. so we can start tracking it and understanding it better. Right. Um, okay, I'd love to, um, we have about five minutes for questions. Or we can talk. keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Yes. Oh, all the way up here. Hold on for one sec. We got to get the mic to you. 
1999, I started um, an effort toward personalized learning for children. And it seemed like no one understood what I was thinking in my head. And so I was invited to a university in town, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the professors that came from cross-curricular disciplines were astonished at the idea. Then I was invited to go to Notre Dame University the following summer, and they were equally astonished. But everyone in the investment community thought I was nuts, truly nuts, and thought that what my thinking was was a one-off. That's not a word I created. So I continued to do what I was doing, and a couple summers ago I heard from a teacher in Montgomery, Alabama, who said, you didn't know that what we were doing, we were partners this year. Because I have a school in my district which has kids that are over age and, and they won't learn. And we tried to take them out of the big school and put them in an academy and they would not learn. And then we put them in a different environment and we chunked the curriculum and they would not learn. So then someone said, oh, we heard about this. And my company is called Awesome Stories. We teach with stories, we teach with primary sources. We take the kids where they have to go on every subject they love. We have over 5,000 stories in about 150,000 linked in safe primary sources. And she said to us, you didn't know that we were partners, but for the first time ever, these kids, every one of these boys met their goals because they were doing what you have been describing up there. That's terrific. And so no matter what is going on in that ballroom across the way, in that, <laughs> in that other hotel, there's nothing more important that's being said today at this hour than what you have just been talking about, number one, as an observation. Number two, how does one collaborate with a group of people like you? Because here we are all around the country, all of us are doing our things, and, and we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to work together. And because not one solution is the perfect solution, there's just not, it's not the case. How do we do that? that I guess that's my biggest question. Here we all are thinking the same thing for almost 20, repeat, 20 years. And here we are all now, at least I am, learning about your situation. You're learning about mine. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll give you two quick pieces of feedback. First, thank you, um, mm -hmm. and don't stop. <laughs> it's a little hard when you're funding it all on your own. I, no, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. So I, I have a couple quick thoughts. One is the power of story is, mm -hmm. in what I was listening to, the narrative, the power of story is the thing that is all of this. It's the reason that any one kid makes it. Um, another thing is um, like how we share. So. Um, for me, being a part of the group that was helping to look at the LEAP framework, um, that's one way that I know they're going to move this out much bigger than I ever can. So I will give my expertise to that group. Um, we have a website, you know, glmeducation.com. You can see examples of every kid, you know, of all of our kids learning in the city. You want to see a city to classroom model? Start. That's that's what I can do. Um, the other things we can do is we we are really transparent about our model. I. I made so many mistakes. I lost so much money along the way. Like, if, you can, if I can save you time and have your kids be better off, then let's do that. The okay. biggest thing I can do is just sh share with other experts who have a bigger. Yeah. And Connie, maybe tell her how to connect to, the, to, to, to your network. Yeah, so we're um, lrng.org, hashtag we are LRNG. Um, would love to have anybody go there and, and connect with us and, and continue the conversation. Um, I'll add one other comment, which is to say, I think as we think about this work going forward, um, stay, on the one hand, I want to say stay local, because it really is, uh, learning is, is local. It is social and it is local, and we have to work in our communities and in our cities, and those are the primary first networks to build. I would say, I mean, if I were still in philanthropy, I would continue to, there are core sets of intermediaries now that I think are really critical to networking at the national or global level. And so it's being able to connect. I, would like, I hope we become one of those. LEAP is absolutely one of those. Digital Promise is another one of those. On the Career and Workforce, Innovate, Educate is another. So they're core intermediaries that we should be sort of holding up that are managing networks, because it's too hard to manage a network. And so philanthropy's gotten a little bit smarter in terms of helping to create those intermediaries that can manage networks. And so participating in those kinds, the networks created by those intermediaries is really critical, I think. 
We have about 30,000 teachers. Any other, I'm sorry. We're so we would plug that in yeah. to you? Yep, that's great. Yeah. Just like one more quick question, and they're gonna cut us off. Any others? I just didn't wanna miss anyone, if they had any other comments. I'm sorry, Tom or, oh, yes. yes. Sorry, I just have a quick question about the um, badge system mm -hmm. and the sort of new forms of assessment and communication around learning. How are some of the top universities, uh, do you see them uh, uh, being able to understand these new models and, and are, are they asking for it? I guess that's, that's a question that I have. Yeah, so the answer is yes and no. Um, there are, so there's a, another intermediary called IMS Global, which is helping to manage standards for interoperability in the higher ed space. And so they're starting to integrate badges into transcripts. And so the extended transcript will be ultimately become a broader extended portfolio, right. which is really critical. Um, and higher ed is dying in a lot of ways. And so we're finding huge openness about, we're, help us figure out how to be innovative and stay alive. And there's, there's 70, um, great, schools, great Schools Partnership in New England has created a partnership of 70 universities, public and private, that accept proficiency-based diplomas. And they've got hundreds of high schools moving in that direction and six legislatures, so yes. it's this beautiful triangle moving towards proficiency, and that is uh, gonna make a big difference. It'll be a, a regional example of how to do this. Great, last comment, Eric. I wanna push you back to digital portfolios and think about the consumer mentality. The consumers can dictate what is in the market. Um, by being transparent about what learning looks like for students, mm -hmm. you're demonstrating what's important. Anecdotally, the kids who have gra the first 40 kids who graduated from our school, which is a crazy project-based school, they averaged $100,000 in merit aid per student. 80% earned merit aid in a school that was all turnaround students in the first five years. That's not because we had the badges yet. That's because they were transparent about what learning looks like. Right. That's awesome. Agreed. Well, thanks, everyone. Please thanks our fantastic yeah. panel. <laughs> thanks for coming. Thanks, folks.